example, um, is it okay for a country to invade another one to take their stuff? And I would just caution us that before we say the kind of the knee jerk thing of no, never. Well, what if your country has no has no drinkable water? What if your country has no food? What if your country has it doesn't have the resources to survive? And you might say, well, it's still evil to to invade another country, but I mean, where do we get these ideas of good and evil from? So let's say, for example, um, is it is it evil or is it good to steal generally? Evil. 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 Generally, evil. Now, let's say that you're starving, or better yet, your family is starving. Um, you're the head of the household, and you have the opportunity to steal some food to feed your family. Is it evil to steal from? Is it evil to steal? We just said it. Yeah. Yeah. Is it evil to let your family starve? Yeah. Yeah. So now you have these two competing evils, and so a lot of times this is what life is. You've got two competing evils. Um, it isn't so much that there's going to be a good situation, the question is going to be which is the less bad situation. And a lot of times war is like this. And I'm talking about particularly war in the past couple hundred years. I mean, not naively saying that there's no corruption or anything like that, but you know, we've, we're kind of past this idea, of, like I said, of going on crusades and, and um, just openly saying, yeah, we don't like your form of government, so we're going to invade you. you know? At least openly, we're, we're kind of against, we're, we're past a lot of those kinds of things. But um, again, if, if you're faced with this thing of like there's two evils, either your people are going to starve or you're going to invade the other country, or the other country um, poses a, a real, a real um, uh, danger to yours, you know, military danger to yours, there's all kinds of problems that we can run into. And, and it, when we start thinking about the world in this very clear way of like um, you know, good and evil, what's, what's inside of this box is good and whatever is outside of this box is evil, and again, we run into these kind of quandaries. So you can steal bread, which is which is evil, or let your family starve, which is evil, because you have an obligation to, to, to feed your family. And again, a lot of times life is like this, and I could probably select all kinds of dilemmas for you where we can see this play out in real life, not just theoretically. And so then the question becomes, how do we then choose what the best course of action is? Well, I guess there's one way of thinking about this. Um, From where do we derive our ideas of good and evil? When we say something is good, something is evil, where do we get the idea from? Yeah. Okay, so parents and parents and parents and parents all the way back. Our history. Okay. So maybe it's through parents, and then of course you said that other the way it's from from religion. Um, okay. Now, when we say that something is either is either right or wrong, good or evil, we're, we're, we're cutting the world into these two very um, these, these two very black and white things of, of things are either in one section or the other. Now, in order for us to be able to say that there is such a thing as right and wrong, there has to be like a, a judge. So let's say, for example, if we're playing Monopoly, and if you're going to put hotels somewhere, I don't know, and then I say to you, oh, that's against the rules. And you're like, no, it's not. How can we find out if it's against the rules? The rule book. We can look at the we can look at the rule book. Um, if we're you know playing a sport, the same idea. If there's some play that was illegal or not, how do we know if it's legal or not? We can go to the rule book. Now, if we're trying to figure out if there's if there's such a thing as right and wrong, the only way that you have a rule book is if you have this. In other words, there has to be somebody who made the rules. There's somebody who made Monopoly, so they can tell you what the rules of Monopoly are. If there's somebody who made the universe, then they can tell you what the rules of the universe are. So this would be, you know, this would be a god. And then the god is the one who then tells the rest of us, here's how you're supposed to live, and here's what you're not supposed to do, here's what you're supposed to do. And they serve as like the rule book, they serve as the referee, let's say. Now, if there's no god, now, how do you determine what's good and evil? So then, at that point, that's just a matter of opinion, then. So then good and evil, then it's just a matter of opinion. So then if I think something is, is good, then it's good. If I, see, if I think something is evil, then it's evil. But we're going to disagree about things, aren't we? Yeah. So then how do we determine who's right and who's wrong? Asking more people. What's that? Asking more people. So then, so then the number of us who, who agree with something determines if it's right or wrong? 
if democratically we decide. Uh, you're going to find there are all kinds of problems with that. Yeah. I think you can Now we run into the problem, of course, of how we determine what real love is. Why isn't toxic love love? Why isn't that real love? No, love is, a, is, is abusive and angry, isn't it? So, my opinion. That's, that's the problem now, yes? Because when we say love is supposed to be this way or that way, we're, we're kind of saying, well, the, that's just another way of saying, I believe that love is supposed to be this way. But if there's no rule book, if there's nothing that tells us what actual love is and what, and what love is not, then it would seem to me that when I say uh, love is abusive and angry, that's just as valid as you saying love is supposed to be caring and caring and there's a second word. Damn it. It wasn't damn, but there's a second word there, carrying in and, and, and something else kind. So now we run into this problem now because if we don't have something objective to be able to say this is what love is, this is what right and wrong is, this is what good and evil is, it's easy for us to just kind of go, well, then yeah, it's just opinion. Well, then I guess, why, why are you so angry at murderers? Why are, you, why are you so angry? Why would we even have a law against it? Why are you so angry at pedophiles? Why are you so angry at thieves? They all just have different opinions, don't they? If, that, if it's really just about opinion, then they just have different opinions. And you might say, well, because they, we live in a society where we've collectively decided what's right and wrong. Yeah, we, we've always done that, haven't we? And that's why we've had things like slavery. That's why we've had things like racism. That's why we've had things like wars. Because when we leave, when we leave it up to the, to the uh, when we leave good and evil up to the majority of people, well, what kind of good and evil do you suppose the majority of people are going to support? One that supports them, one that make, one that lifts them up, and then if you try to, of course, if you try to resist against that, well, then that means that you're trying to resist the good, which naturally makes you evil. So if you try to change anything in society, then that automatically means that you're evil, right? And you see that we run into all of these kinds of problems with it. And so what we actually might mean when we say that something is good or evil is just I like this and I don't like that. But Nietzsche would say that there is no such thing as, as God. In fact, he, he says God is dead. And he says that it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a tragedy because now we, we have lost our way of right and wrong because once we recognize that, society, that, that science has eliminated the need for a belief in a God, well, now we can figure out how to get to the stars, but we can't figure out if we should get to the stars. And then there's a vacuum that gets left. And so that's one of his famous statements, that God is dead. Um, I see you guys, if I see any of you guys in two years, we'll, we'll read something where he, he talks about this. But now, of course, the problem becomes how then do you determine what's right and wrong? And what he would say is, it's the thing that lifts up and elevates your nature. So why is stealing wrong? Stealing is only wrong, really, for one reason. Because if you get caught, then your freedom gets, gets, gets limited. You get thrown in jail. That's pretty much it. You shouldn't murder people. Why? Because if you get caught murdering a person, you go to prison. And if you're in prison, you can't maximize who you really are. If we're living, if it's true that there's no such thing as God, then that means that we're pretty much just, um, we're just advanced animals. The, mo the most advanced animal on the planet, we're really just animals. And so then you ask this question, well then where does this idea of right and wrong come from? Well then it becomes pretty clear. If you have gazelles and you have lions living in the wild, and there's three times as many gazelles, let's say, as there are lions, because there are, then imagine if you gave gazelles the right to vote. What kind of laws do you think they would pass? Lions can't kill. Yeah, lions can't kill. <laughs> lions, it's, yeah, it's wrong. It's wrong for lions to kill. And then that's the thing that constrains lions from being able to kill. And if you can even get to a point of, well, why shouldn't lions kill? Well, because it's wrong. What do you mean it's wrong? Well, it's immoral. What do you mean by it's immoral? Well, there's this gazelle heaven and hell that, that lions go to, depending on whether or not you kill gazelles. 
And then you can see how now, if you can, if you can shape a society this way, the society is not shaped in such a way to lift up lions and allow lions to become the best lions they could. Instead, morality is designed to hold the lions back from what they could become. You stop them from stealing. Why? Well, because I can't stop them from stealing, so I have to get 50 gazelles together to stop this one lion from stealing. And that's what we call law. That's what we call morality. And so he said that all laws that, that, that are designed this way, they're, 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 they're limiting the strength of the most powerful people. So then if you want to be powerful and you want to maximize what you possibly could be, what do you have to do? Well, you have to ignore these ideas of right and wrong and good and evil. And you have to understand that all they are is the opinions of people around you who are too weak to stand on their own. So these are people who have to collectively get together and say, we have decided that this is wrong, that this is evil. So what's your, and then he refers to this as the herd, herd morality. And so what's the only proper thing for that lion to do if they find themselves, into, uh, uh, they find themselves against a, a herd of gazelles? Ignore them and go about their lives. Because they're just gazelles, why does the lion care about the opinion of gazelles? There's something completely different. There's something that, rather than, maxi rather than maximizing themselves and becoming stronger, gazelles instead will occupy their lives with holding back the strength of lions. Because it's easier to hold people back than to become stronger yourself. In fact, you'll even find that gazelles will even start to, to indulge in the fact that they're weak. Well, we have to do this. Why? Because lions will harm us otherwise. Oh, yeah, you're right. Now we have to be indulged in the fact that we're weak and that we're not as, as strong as lions. And then that's the thing that kind of brings us all together. Well, we have to be together. Why? Because those lions are strong. And they're going to eat us if we don't pass these laws. And so if that's the case, then we can understand that all morality, all laws, all of these things that are designed to constrain behavior are not designed to constrain behavior generally. They're designed to constrain the behavior of the strong to the benefit, or the supposed benefit, of the weak. So of course, all that that does is it makes the weak weaker, and then all it does is it really alienates the strong from the rest of society. And so what we're doing out of love, and by love, he's not talking about sentimental emotion. He's talking about something that we do out of duty. There, there are different forms of love, um, only one of which is about emotion and sentiment. The strongest form of love for the Greeks is something called agape, which is a, a love that you do out of duty. Not something that you do because you feel a certain way, but it's because you have a, 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 an obligation to do it. It's a self-imposed obligation, by the way. You ever see an old couple that's like 80 years old and they've been married for 90 years? They've been married 10 years longer than they've been alive? And you ask them, like, well, why, why are you guys still married? And they're like, that's what we do. You know? And you see these old couples, you see these old couples like fight constantly? I almost got into a fight with an with a old man a few years ago. I was in a Vons and he would, he, he, I was in the ice cream section because that's usually where you can find me in a supermarket. And he's and this old man and, he, and he's trying to get some ice cream and his wife, they gotta, they gotta be like 180 years old, man. And he's like, I, I want some ice cream. And she's like, you can have ice cream, it's bad for you. He's like, I don't care, I wanna get some ice cream. And he's trying to get some and she's like closing the door and she's like, no, you know you're not allowed to have some ice cream. So I stupidly was standing there and I said, hey, Get out of the man's ass. He wants some ice cream. I look at him like, I got you, brother. And he's like, what the hell? Did you, you, you watch your mouth. I'll kick your ass. You talk to her like that. Okay, I'll punch a 90. I'll give her 9 or 99. <laughs> but you look at something like that. It's like, why are they argue? Because that's what they do. And then what, what else do you do? You defend, you know, he, he has an obligation out of Agape to defend his wife. To defend her. And of course she has that same obligation to him, to defend him. And so you see that this is a, a love that's way stronger than we have an emotional attachment to each other. And so the things that you do out of obligation, these are the things that you do that are, that are beyond good and evil. They're beyond those judgments. Oh, you shouldn't do that. It's evil. That's interesting. And you go about your life anyway. Well, really, you shouldn't. <laughs> oh, there's no rule book, man. God is dead. There's no rule book. We're here. And what do lions do? Lions, lions have the strongest lions, the strongest lions to make the strongest lions to perpetuate themselves. And if that's true, that we're just part of that same animal kingdom, then it sounds like that's what we should be doing as well. Having the strongest people make the strongest people so that we can become the strongest thing in the, on the planet. Smart, of course, strong as well, of course. 
But you can't do that unless you can kind of get rid of these ideas of, of, of morality and good and evil, um, antiquated anyway. And so it isn't even a matter of updating morality, by the way. Because they tell you update morality, it's what it's going to be more than anything. It's going to be what do the masses say about something. And the masses are weak. I mean, my goodness, when you're, um, I mean, geez, Louise, just look around in, any, in most of the classes, how many people are really excelling. Look around at the company, how many people in a company are really excelling. There's this, uh, there's this rule that you'll discover as you guys go and get jobs, that um, if you take a, a workforce of 100 people, let's say, um, the general rule is that 50% of your production is done by the square root of the number of your employees. So let's say you have 100 employees at your business. Uh, what's the square root of 100? 10. Ten. That means that 10 of your employees are doing 50% of the production. And your other 90 employees are responsible for the other 50% of the production. You can see how these folks right here are way outproducing everybody else. And this is what Nietzsche would point to. He said, this is kind of the way that society works. So of course, this group right here has an incentive to keep things as they are, because they benefit disproportionately to the work of the, of the strong, the people who are doing well. And you're going to find that that's true in, or, in organizations and a company. You're going to find that it's true in, in, in systems of government. You're going to find that it's true in, heck, even in schools, everywhere you go. This is a hard and fast rule that you find. Because the people who, who aren't able to, to compete, but are able to ride along. Now, by doing that, do these people become stronger? No. They actually make them worse because they get used to the idea of being able to ride along. Yeah. So even if you are still fascinated by the idea of evil, then perhaps Nietzsche would say you're doing evil by allowing people to ride along. Because they will never become lying. They'll never get to maximize what they could have been otherwise. And that's not loving. If there was such a thing, I guess we would call it evil. So, questions, comments, concerns, complaints, criticisms, critiques?